It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Gil Levin. He worked on the Viking labeled release experiment in 1976, and he is going to discuss that as well as current um, discoveries and information about the state of is there or isn't there life on Mars. Welcome, Dr. Levin. Thank you. Now I'm on. Well, before I begin, I have a partial disclaimer to make, and it is that uh, I was an experimenter aboard Mariner 9, the first vehicle to orbit Mars. And with that in mind, uh, and with some apology to Samuel Taylor Coleridge, I am that ancient mariner who stoppeth all of thee. And I do bid each one of you, please take heed of me. I'm going to convince you there is life on Mars. <laughs> now, when Viking landed, and we immediately, in 1976, probably many people here don't even remember that, but when it landed, our experiment, the labeled release experiment, immediately got positive data for microbial life in the surface material of Mars. Well, everyone got very excited until until the instrument to identify the organics, which everyone knew had to be on Mars, because they come from the same place that organics come from on Earth, so we just wanted to identify them. They found none. That instrument found none. At that point, the decision had to be made. Here's an experiment which says life. Here's an experiment which says no organics. You can't have both. So the Viking principal scientist made the pronouncement which has lasted ever since through NASA's corridors that no organics, there goes the ball game, no life. And I then immediately responded. I didn't claim we had detected life. I said our results were consistent with life. And it took me a long time, until 1997, to say they were life. But uh, I raised the question right then, maybe there's something wrong with the GCMS, with the organic detector. And that's when they hung this uh, albatross around my neck. So I am the ancient mariner with the albatross, and what I'm trying to do is convince you that this should be turned into a bluebird. Uh, Curiosity is helping that, more so than the two speakers you just heard would uh, acclaim, and I will show you that in a minute. The LR, Labeled Release Experiment, is based on an ancient, it's 100 years old now, uh, public health determination of contamination of water, food, whatever. It's a simple thing. You take a piece of sample and you put it in a broth tube and you stick it in an incubator and you watch and in a day or two or three, if you see bubbles in there, that is evidence that there's something alive in there. Well, we made that experiment even more specific and harder to fool. Rather than wait two or three days to see the bubbles, uh, we put carbon-14 in there into the nutrients that were used, and they, the gas coming out was immediately detectable. Furthermore, instead of using a full tube 10 milliliters of nutrient, we found that if you just put a drop of nutrient on the soil, you got an immediate explosion of gas coming out, and there was no lag phase. 
All the biology books on microbiology show you the lag phase when you start a culture. Well, in this experiment, we showed there is no lag phase, and we did this hundreds, thousands of times uh, on Earth. We added additional nutrients because we're going to a foreign planet. So we had formate, alanine, glycine, glycolate, lactate. And alanine and lactate have two isotopes, so we added both, the L and the D isomers. And in the case that Mars life had a different chirality than Earth life, we would still find it. Most importantly, however, the LR added a control. The public health method has no control. You see bubbles, that's life. We thought there might be people, like some in the audience, who would be skeptical even if we got gas coming out. So we conferred with NASA, and it was decided not only we, but all the life detection experiments should have a control. The control selected by NASA was, if you get a positive, take a duplicate sample of that same stuff and heat it to 160 degrees for three hours, which they said would kill any organism known on Earth, let it cool, and then run the LR test on it again. If you get nothing or very little, that confirms that the first positive was life. If you get a large response, that confirms that a chemistry fooled you and the first reaction was not one of life. Here is a schematic of the labeled release experiment. Very simple. There is a uh, chamber of, in which we put just half a cc of soil. Uh, then the nutrient, 0.15 milliliters, very tiny fraction of a drop, is injected on there. And when learning from Pasteur, we put a couple of baffles in there so no dust or detritus or aerosol would go up into the counting chamber where the carbon-14 was counted. We tested this thing, as I said, thousands of times. We went to many distant locales. Mostly we tested in the laboratory, but here just to show you for fun, we went to Death Valley, incidentally where there is less moisture as determined by JPL than on Mars. 0.9%. Curiosity reports several percent. We went to the salt and sea, and instantly both places got responses. And we went above the timberline, White Mountain, California, and instantly got a positive response. Now, as I understand it, the way science is supposed to work, you come up with a theory and you make a projection of what would happen if you perform an experiment testing the theory. We did that. Back way before Viking, I prepared this curve of what I thought would happen if there were life on Mars. And take a good look at the test, positive, and the control. Now at this point, we weren't using heat as a control, we were using an anti-metabolite, so it took a while to work, but you can see there's a significant difference between the test and the control. So that was our prediction. We got to Mars, and these are each of the first injection cycles at the first landing site. And you can see uh, cycle one, which was active, a very good response, up at about 10,000 counts per minute and we followed it for eight sols, the length of the experiment. The other uh, uh, cycle one, uh, cycle two, was our control. We all held our breath as to what the control would reveal, and zilch, the control. So right then, we could have gone home. We discovered life on Mars, we confirmed it, hooray. As a matter of fact, I bought a bottle of champagne, I still have the cork. <laughs> uh, we then decided to 
try and generate a new burst of gas and made a second injection, thinking that maybe the nutrient had been exhausted or the available nutrient, because the amount coming out corresponded roughly to one nutrient. But nothing happened, nothing happened. 4,000 miles away at Lander 2, we ran through the same thing, except there is one interesting point I'd make. Cycle 1 was active, as you see, but instead of doing the 160 degree thing, I said, you guys aren't going to believe it, because I was already getting guff. You aren't going to believe the 160 if we repeat it, so let's reduce it to 50 and see what happens. And the engineers were able to do that. The bottom uh, curve is what was produced by the 51 degrees which they actually achieved. And you can see it's very strange. I think there's something hidden in there. We had the engineers test the instrument. There was nothing wrong with the instrument. It worked perfectly on all additional cycles. We then said, let's do that again. And we did. And that's cycle four. At, they only achieved 46 degrees. And we got a 30% a response of a positive. That's intriguing, because if you want to separate coliforms from E. coli on Earth, you separate the incubation temperatures by 5 degrees C. However, we wanted to go a step further and put a second injection onto the soil, and we were betting which way the curve was going to go. And what happened was it just dropped down abruptly. So right away, the naysayers said, that's proof. It's not biology. You gave it more nutrient. Nothing happened. Well, we had done many assays. So we went and looked in our library, and we found an Antarctic soil, which did that also. And as a matter of fact, I did an experiment with lichen and found the same thing. Give them too much water, they don't like it. So the characteristics of the active agent on Mars produce responses very similar to Earth responses. The control worked, no response. The difference in response to the 46 and 51 degrees. Most interestingly, we wanted to take a sample, and Jim Martin, project engineer, said, you can't do it. It's winter. we got to wait. So instead of waiting several months to get another sample, we took one of the samples that had been sitting around in the distribution box and had been positive in our experiment, sitting around for a couple of months. And lo and behold, it had lost all its activity. So whatever it is that's active on Mars, producing our response, loses that activity sometime between uh, five days, which was the most we held it in the box before injecting it in the instrument, and uh, two months. And that is a very strange material. You saw this before. And Unfortunately, the most important piece of information was not mentioned. And it is the water seen on the left-hand side at a temperature of zero degrees C. Now, I give you, we've had a long argument over the years about water on Mars. Viking detected liquid water on Mars. But ever since, it's been denied. Here's curiosity confirming there is liquid water available for biology on Mars. Where is that water vapor coming from at zero degrees C? It's coming from ice, which is available once the threshold of the uh, temperature freezing point is crossed, or there's liquid water. But either one is available to microorganisms. So that, to me, the left-hand bottom corner is the most important piece of all of this data. On Mars, there are green rocks that have been seen. This is an image from Curiosity. Well, the same happened on Viking. Here we have three images taken one Mars year apart. And patch rock, I call this patch rock, because the one at about a third up has a green patch on it. And I went to JPL and looked at all 10,000 images taken and found these 
they're taken at the same sun angle, and you can see there's a change in the shape and the color, of not only of patch rock, but in the background as well. Well, at first, everyone denied there was any green there at all. They said it's all gray. Finally, however, uh, other people confirmed that there's green color, and now it's clearly the case. So we contended that that was interesting, but certainly not proof of life, but it should be evaluated. Here are two images. The left side shows lichen on Earth in my backyard. It's a white lichen. And this is something that Curiosity sent down from Mars. Again, certainly no proof, but certainly a scientific curiosity should be aroused to send the camera over there and take a close-up image, which they can do, and compare these. I think, uh, I don't see how they cannot do it. We were talking about uh, this strange light that's been seen by Curiosity, and we've talked a lot about methane. And what I wonder, is it possible that we have here a will-o'-the-wisp? Now, on Earth this occurs frequently. Methane coming out of the ground it becomes ignited spontaneously or hit by lightning or whatever, and glows. To do that, though, you need oxygen to make a combustion. Well, is it possible on, that on Mars the perchlorate which Curiosity has confirmed, is in dust that's swirling around, which you've seen on this screen, and that supplies the oxidant, and this is perhaps a will-o'-the-wisp. Now, about organics. There goes the ball game, organics. Uh, Curiosity has now confirmed organics, but a strange thing occurred. The BBC on March, 20, March 20th, 2015, interviewed Danny Glavin. Is Danny here? No. Interviewed Danny Glavin, I'm safe to say this. <laughs> he said, or the reporter said that Danny said, complex organics, long chain fatty acids and lipids such as the molecules found in all terrestrial microbial membranes were found. And that Glavin was going to report that at LPNI that afternoon. Well, he didn't. It was not in the paper published. So I got in touch with him and asked him about that. And he said, in a personal communication, the findings were preliminary and not published. He then referred me to Carolyn Frisonet. Is she here, Carolyn here? No. Because she knew more about this. And she told me that yes, they did find complex long chain lipids, complex carboxylic acids and alcohols, but since they haven't identified them yet, they hadn't published it. This is the evidence that we got for life on Mars. There is direct empirical evidence, four positive responses, two from each lander, five controls supporting the positives, and there is a lot of circumstantial evidence. As you know, particularly with some of the news today, circumstantial evidence counts heavily in many important court trials. We have now learned that Mars contains schnapps, all the essential life elements. Despite people saying that the radiation on Mars is extreme or there isn't available liquid water or the temperature is too low, that's not the case because they didn't address where stuff on Earth lives. It lives frozen in ice and the South Polar Cap, and does very well. Moreover, the Russians reported that on the International Space Station, they found lichen and bacteria, several species, on the outside surface that had been there a year and a half before they discovered them by just cleaning that surface. So 
we're, we're cutting life short, not giving it credit, not giving Darwin credit for how the organisms can evolve. They lived in the naked space environment, terribly cold, full radiation, and they survived. The entire one and a half years, they were there. Recently, there have been three reports of stromatolite features on rocks on Mars. Now, stromatolites are built up by microorganisms secreting minerals over the years. Nora Nofke, University of Virginia, published a paper stressing that some of the formations seen by curiosity bear a striking resemblance to stromatolites on Earth. But then came along Giorgio Bianchiardi, published two papers. He agreed with that, but moreover, he's a quantitative guy, and he did some mathematic analysis and came up with a startling conclusion that the probability that the features on Mars match the features on Earth by chance alone was a P of less than .004. I think that would make Curiosity run right up to that possible stromatolite, get some close-up pictures, and let's see if we can't see something biological. Well, I made predictions about Curiosity a year ago in a paper I published that Curiosity would confirm liquid water and that Curiosity would find complex organics, and also urged Curiosity to take a close look up of the rocks. My predictions have come through. Now, Pat Stratt and I, Pat's my co-experimenter on Viking, she's too ill to be here today, uh, we make some more predictions. We think more and more complex biotype organic molecules will be detected, we think that high-resolution images of the colored patches on rocks and the stromatolite will support biology. And we think that ratios of the stable isotopes of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and iron, and sulfur will support biology. You heard just the speaker before me say, well, it leaves it open, but doesn't prove it. We need additional evidence. I give you the additional evidence. And there is no one who would challenge this result had it been made on Earth. I suggest as a recommendation that we do what Carol Stoker suggests. Is Carol here? Hey, Carol. If you want to look for life, look for life. And NASA has not done that for 40 years. They have not sent another life detection instrument to Mars. I can't understand that. It boggles me. We propose to send a little dart on a cart, and these things would test the chirality of the organisms found. No astrobiologist has disagreed that if the substance shows a chirality in metabolism, it's alive, because chemistry cannot distinguish. So I, uh, you know, I'm very puzzled at the tenor of all the remarks. There are so many abortionists when it comes to Mars. And I would just like to end asking for a show of hands of how many believe there is life on Mars. My God. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. It's really been fun. Please wait for the mic. Please wait for the mic before you ask your question. Speak loudly. Gil, you were much too much of a gentleman in the sense that you did not trash Klaus Beeman's mass spec enough. But let me do it for you. So we showed 15 years ago in, Chris, in my laboratory, and Chris McKay, of course, has made that story quite persuasive. The, the mass spec that was used in 1976, Viking 2, discredit the label release experiments, could not have detected organic material had it been sitting on a pile of it. And uh, 
therefore the argument against your argument has evaporated. It does not mean necessarily your argument is true, but the argument against your argument in the 1970s is just wrong. Hello. Uh, I'd like to ask you to comment on your views on the significance of the recent detections of methane on Mars. Uh, can you hear me now? I'd like to ask you to comment on your views of the significance of the recent detections of methane on Mars. Hey, um, what is your opinion about the fossilized uh, bacteria inside the meteorite A ALH? I did believe that and uh, hope that it turns out true. And there are some startling images that Curiosity took that look something like the worm-like things that Dave McCain took. Doctor, uh, just to throw another uh, monkey in wrench into this works here. Did you know about the extremophiles that are going to different pl places on the Earth and finding pl places where there are bacteria and things that are growing that you would not expect? Uh, can you hear me, sir? And, and the... I, th I think this. Well, my, my, my comment was, did you know that on one of the uh, later Apollo missions, they went to um, the surveyor, one of the landers, Higher. Uh, they went to one of the landers with a surveyor uh, previous, the one of the unmanned probes, and they took a part off of it, and they brought it back to Earth. They found it was contaminated with bacteria that had been there dormant for about four years, and they reanimated it, and it grew. So I don't know if you knew about that.
some people who said there might have been life on Mars once, but not now. If life ever got a toehold, it would have evolved and would certainly be there. And I don't express any preference for where to land or to sample. Just sample the surface. That's where you're going to find 